So we learn that there are two worlds, the world of man whose breath is in his nostril, the man of earth, the creature who is not under the law of God, neither indeed can be, mortal man. And then there is the world of the Son of God, the spiritual universe, in which life is lived not by might, nor by power, nor by taking thought, but by divine grace. And that grace is only made manifest in proportion as you are not trying to receive it, but to share it. You are not trying to get it, but to share it, to let it flow. You do receive it. In our outer sense, we receive it from the kingdom of God that is within us, but we're not trying to receive it for ourselves. We're trying to open out a way that the imprisoned splendor may escape to this world. Now, in this spiritual kingdom, we're going to for a time now leave this other world alone because we already know too much about it, but we do not yet know enough about my kingdom. And in the life that is lived in my kingdom, where we live by grace, where we live without taking thought, we find ourselves in a new position. And here we learn, and this may surprise many of you, not that you don't know it, but that you never realize the dynamic nature of it, God gave us dominion over everything there is between the skies and the bottom of the sea. God gave us dominion. What has happened to that dominion? That we have allowed the stars to have influence over us, or that we have allowed weather or climate or germs to have influence over us, or that we have allowed dictators to have influence over us. What has happened to that dominion? And the answer is that we have given it away. Bit by bit, we surrendered our dominion and became the prodigal son. Now, in our divine sonship, we must once again accept dominion. And this means that we create our own world. The world does not create conditions for us. People do not create conditions for us. We are not the victims of politics. We are not the victims of war or dictators. We are not the victims of circumstances or conditions. We are not the victims of sin or disease. Why? By God's grace, we have dominion, but we must now declare it, assert it. I have a God-given dominion over all that exists between the heavens and the bottom of the sea. And never again must I give dominion to man Condition, circumstance, weather, climate, storm, drought, depression, or even booms. 
I must live henceforth in the kingdom of God under the regulations revealed to us by the master Christian. And now let me give you this. I am come that ye might have life, and that ye might have life more abundant. I'm calling your attention to the word I. This does not mean Jesus. This does not mean Buddha. This does not mean your teacher or practitioner. The I is closer to you than breathing. It is your very self. It is the I that you declare when you say I. That I is with you. That I will never leave you nor forsake you. Tell me some place you can go and leave I behind you. I was with you before Abraham was. I will be with you unto the end of the world. And your Savior, your Redeemer, is the I that is at the center of your being. You do not go anywhere for supply because I, in the midst of you, am your bread, your meat, your wine, and your water. And therefore you dare not even go to God for supply because you already have I in the midst of you, the Son of God, the Christ of God, the Spirit of God, which is that I in the midst of you, and that I is your bread, meat, wine, and water. As a matter of fact, I am the resurrection. This would be no good to you if Jesus were the resurrection because he left here 2,000 years ago and the world is waiting for his second coming. Therefore, you would be without that I. But you see, it says, I will never leave thee. Therefore, you do not have to wait for a second coming. You only have to acknowledge that the I that Jesus proclaimed, which he acknowledged existed before Abraham, that he acknowledged will exist under the end of the world, is in the midst of you. Therefore, the resurrection of your body, of your health, of your wealth, of your marriage, of your home, of your family, the resurrection power is within you. You will never demonstrate this as long as you are expecting it to come from some source outside of you, even if it's a holy personage, you will miss the way. For I am in the midst of you. I, in the midst of you, am come that you might have life. The I. And to yourself, to yourself now, this moment, say the word I, softly, gently, I, I. That very I in the midst of you is the law of resurrection. It is the same spiritual life that is operating in your trees and going to bring apples and pears and peaches this summer and roses in profusion. That very selfhood, that very spiritual presence of God that is right now working in your plants to bring forth next month's fruitage, that I is working in you to resurrect your body, your health, your family, your loves, your careers.
I know that if you accept the testimony of this world, by the time you're 45, you can't find employment anymore because you're too old. By the time you're 60 or 65, you're retired to await death. If you accept that, you allow that to be a law unto you, then you become a victim of this world. But if you understand that I, in the midst of you, am God, be still and know. Remember, it's addressed to you. Be still and know that I am God. Now you be still. Be still and know that I, in the midst of you, am God. And then you will know that that I is the presence of God that has come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, not until 40, 50, 60, 70, but I am life eternal. I am the resurrection. And I am come even to restore the lost years of the locust the years that have sped by in your ignorance of the truth that God is in the midst of you, closer to you than breathing, now becomes a law of resurrection into your entire experience. Be still and know that I am God. Do you see what the kingdom of God is like as against this world of mortals? groveling at the feet of some unknown God, praying for crumbs, when the true God in the midst of us has made us heir of the entire kingdom. Be still only. Be still. Tell no man what things ye have seen. Pray in secret that not to be seen of men, Pray in secret, and the prayer is, be still, be still and know that I, in the midst of me, is God. And this I, in the midst of me, has come, has been planted in the midst of me, that I might have life, life more abundant. Shall I lend you some money? Shall I buy you some food? And the answer comes right back from within you. I have meat the world knows not of. I have meat this world knows not of. For I am the child of God. I have meat bread and wine and water. I have a divine substance. I have the law of God in the midst of me, of which the world knows nothing and can know nothing, because the world cannot know God or the things of God. It takes spiritual discernment to recognize that I, in the midst of you, is God, and that its function there is that you might have life and that you might have life more abundant and that its function there is to be your bread, meat, wine and water. That nobody has to go to the city to get anything for you. That you already have meat the world knows not of. I have meat. And so every time you are faced with an appearance of barrenness out here, emptiness, lack, limitation, hug to yourself, sacredly and secretly, thank you, Father, I have meat the world knows not of. I have, closer to me than breathing, the Spirit of God, the life of God, the love of God. Did you know that neither life nor death can separate me from the love of God? neither life nor death. 
the place whereon I stand is holy ground, this side of the veil or the other side of the veil, in sickness or in health, in purity or in sin. The place whereon I stand is holy ground because I can do all things through Christ which dwelleth in me, the Son of God, I. Christ is one name, the other name is I. They both mean the same thing, the presence of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God, the love of God. Therefore, the Christ that is your Savior, the Christ that is the resurrection unto you, the Christ that is your mediator, this is the presence and power of God that God established in you in the beginning and which you have been seeking as they sought the Holy Grail in the outer world. Do you remember how they traveled all around the world seeking that Holy Grail, never stopping until they were bankrupt, until they were sick and weak and old, and then came home wearily and discovered it hanging on a tree in their own garden. So it is the world is seeking God. And it's traveling from one religion to another, from one teaching to another, and one teacher to another, until finally they'll discover one who will say to them, but you have it within you. That which you are seeking, you already embody within yourself. It constitutes your very being. And then you will understand why you are free, absolutely living a life of freedom in Christ. Why? Because for everything I turn within. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostril, for wherein is he to be accounted of? I have meat the world knows not of. I have the Savior, the Mediator, the presence and the power of God, the wisdom of God and the love of God is locked up in the I that I am. Be still and know that I am God, and then rest. Rest in the assurance that I, in the midst of you, is God. And then, as you go about your daily living, breathe silently, sacredly, secretly, my peace give I unto thee. Not as the world giveth, my peace, Christ's peace, give I unto thee. And be a benediction wherever you travel. Once you, in your own consciousness, accept yourself as a benediction, you will find yourself living less and less as a human being and more and more as a divine being. But you must accept yourself as a benediction so that wherever you travel, you can bestow God's grace on those still in darkness. Probably the most difficult part of this practice is that we have to begin it inside of our own homes. Now since we know everybody so well there, it's very difficult for us to agree that the members of our own household are all saints. But they are. And if we are seeing them as other than saints, we are the ones who are in error, not they. Because God never made any other than a saint. Now our dominion consists in this, that what is called this world 
exists only in our thought. Out here, there is no such thing as sin, disease, or death, lack, or limitation. Out here, those things do not exist. Therefore, if we are experiencing them, we are experiencing them in our own thought and projecting the image outwardly. In other words, it is like a moving picture. The picture is actually back here on the film, but it projects it out there on the screen. And of course, if we didn't know better, we would think the picture is out there on the screen. But it really isn't. It's back here on the film. So it is, in our ignorance, we think that there are sick and sinning people out here. There aren't. They're up here in our own image, in our own thought. That's the only place they exist. No other place. And the proof of that is this. Someone comes to us and says they are sick or they're sinning. And after they've come to us for a day, a week, a month, or whatever it may be, all of a sudden they say, I'm not sick or sinning. Now what brought about that change? Because in the practitioner's consciousness, they didn't accept sin or disease. Therefore, the image or picture of it dissolved and disappeared. If the practitioner accepted sin or disease, the patient did not get healed. That is why there was so much failure in the healing world while we were looking for error in the patient's thought. We were looking for it there and we usually found it. Well, that's exactly what the psychologists and the psychiatrists do. They look for the error in your thought and after they find it, they don't know what to do with it. There it is. Now, how do you get it out? Oh, they haven't gotten that far yet. And that happened in the metaphysical world. They began to look for error in the patient's thought. And the sad thing is, they sometimes found it there. And then after they found it, they didn't know what to do with it. But we know better now, and we certainly know better in this work, Thou art the Christ of God. And in my consciousness, that is how I accept you. And you may say to me that you are sick, or that you're in sin, or that you're in poverty. But I can't accept that because I have already accepted the Bible, which says that God made all that was made and all that God made is good, and anything that God did not make was not made. Therefore, there could be no such thing as evil, sin, disease, or death. So who can convince me that you are sick or in sin or dead? Nobody. Therefore, as long as I can hold to the fact that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, neither do I condemn thee, neither do I find any fault in thee. You must eventually respond. And since I have not accepted your mortality in my thought, it must die. So it is. <clears throat> we have to begin in our household. Now I know as well as everybody else does that family living is not the easiest thing in the world because it's lived in such close relationship to each other and we're so apt to show the worst side of ourselves to each other that I know that from a human standpoint this is a very difficult thing. But it is not difficult from a spiritual standpoint. In other words, if I am willing to sit down for five minutes each day and realize that this is the household of God. It is not my household. It is the household of God. And those who tabernacle here are of the household of God, fellow saints. And 
and that God's grace governs, maintains, and sustains all within this household. Even if for a while the human relationships do not seem to improve, be assured that we need only be steadfast in setting aside five minutes each day to realize since the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, this household is the household of God. And all those who dwell herein are offspring of God, heirs of God, joint heirs of God. We are not dependent upon each other. We share with each other God's grace. The father has qualities of thought to share with the wife and the children. The wife has qualities of love and companionship to share with the husband and the children. The children have qualities of God to share with the parents. But none of us are dependent on each other. We just mutually share those qualities that God has given us. We hold no member of the family in bondage to their sins, to their errors to their disposition. We realize that whatever is not of God must disappear because it has no law of God to sustain it. We recognize that I, in the midst of each member of this household, am God. And you see, it will not take too long until you will find a greater degree of harmony in the household. Then you can begin to practice the same truth with your neighbors, with your relatives, with your friends, with your community, with your business, with your school, with your profession. And before a couple of years are around, you'll be doing world work. You'll be embracing what we call Russia and China and all the rest of these places in our consciousness and realizing that if we feel there is any evil in them, it's in us. There can be no evil in them. There can be no evil in them. God did not create one person good and another bad. God did not create one person well and another sick. Therefore, we have dominion. If we accept sinning people in our consciousness, we will have sin. If we accept sick people in our consciousness, we will have sickness. If we accept evil people, we will have evil. But if I refuse, do you know what the Master said? I stand at the door and knock. I. Do you know what would happen, what does happen, when you open your consciousness and say, enter? Well, just think. When you're thinking of a member of your family, when you're thinking of some of the politicians you read about, and I use that word in its worst sense, if it has a good one, I don't know. When you think of the so-called dictators, just remember that I am in the midst of them. And that I that is in the midst of them is knocking at your door for entrance. And if you will admit the I of the dictators, the I of the sinners, the eye of the diseased, physically or mentally. Don't open your consciousness to their humanhood, because you're opening your consciousness to an illusory picture. But open your consciousness to the eye of every individual. In other words, when you think of Joel, don't think of Joel in his humanhood. 
even if by chance uh, you think well of it. Don't do it. It's no healing influence to me. But when you think of me, think of I, and open your consciousness to the I of me. Then you will be blessed and I will be blessed. And in the same way, when you think of the members of your family, don't think of them in their humanhood. We all know what they are in their humanhood. We all have them. And we don't like all of them. We don't like what we see and behold. But turn from that and remember that the eye of them is knocking at the door of your consciousness seeking admittance. And you'll heal them. You'll heal all who are receptive and responsive. I, the I of me, is knocking at the door of your consciousness, wanting you to say, I know who thou art. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the I of you is knocking at the door of my consciousness and begging that I see you as you are, not as you appear humanly to be. The I of you is knocking at the door of my consciousness, begging entrance. You want me to see you as you are. You want me to behold you as the image of God, the way you were created in the beginning, before time began. None of you want me to see you as you are humanly. Even those of you who think you are good or think you are beautiful, you don't want me to see you that way. You want me to see you as God made you. And that means the I of you is knocking at the door of my consciousness, wanting me to say, I know, thou who, now I know thee who thou art, the Christ, the Son of the living God. I spiritually discern your true identity. You don't know it. That is why you came to this evening. You came here to be recognized in your spiritual identity so that whatever is mortal of you might be dissolved. Probably you thought of it as, I might get healed there, or I might get reformed there, or I might get employed there, or I might get blessed there. That was the decoy. But the truth is, you came to this room to be recognized in your spiritual identity because that is why I came here. I did not come here to heal anybody, to reform anybody, or enrich anybody. I came here not only to behold the Christ of you, but to reveal to you the Christ of your own identity. I don't have to say it orally to do it. I didn't even have to make mention of it. I could have had it locked up silently within me, and you would have known when you went out of here that you had been seen in your spiritual, you had been known, recognized in your spiritual identity, because it is so. As long as I do not look upon you as male or female, young or old, rich or poor, I am beholding you as God made you in his image and likeness. And in doing this, I am giving recognition to your true identity, your Christhood. And as I give recognition to it, I bring it forth in some measure into identity. And so, you begin with your household. And in the morning, you have time for five or ten minutes of quiet. And if you don't have the time, make the time. Let something else wait. And then take those that are nearest, closest to you, and begin to look through the appearance and recognize that in the midst of them the Son of God dwells. I, the Son of God, I, the Christ of God, am indwelling. And you witness, bear witness, 
to that Christ of God in them. And you will see how very soon they will begin to respond and show more of their Christhood and less of their mortality. So it goes until eventually we're really not aware of uh, humans as we once were. We're not quite aware of how they look or what they're wearing. It's more an inner discernment of something that's shining through their eyes. Sometimes even those who do not themselves know that it's there. But always remember this. I stand at the door and knock. No, there is an I, Christ, of yourself standing at the door of your consciousness begging your acknowledgement and recognition so that you must many times a day close your eyes for a second and just say, yes, I recognize I in the midst of me, my Christhood. I recognize this is my bread, meat, wine, and water. This is my, rec my resurrection. I recognize that I in the midst of me is come that I might have life and that I might have it more abundantly. So this I that's knocking at your door you have now admitted. But then remember that as someone enters your household or even your thought, remember that the I of them is knocking at the door of your consciousness asking to be admitted. You know why a person who isn't living up to the full integrity of their humanhood doesn't like to be condemned for it is that they know truly that it isn't they who are bad, that it's something that temporarily has dominion over them. And in the same way, very few people like to be uh, complimented. I mean by that uh, praised for their goodness or their benevolence or their virtue. They'd rather say, oh, oh, no, 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 no. And the reason is that they also know that that is not a quality of themselves, that it's really uh, something that's uh, shining through them. Well, so it is. We don't want to be praised, but we don't mind having the Christhood of us praised and acknowledged. We don't want to be condemned because the evil that we do, we're not trying to do or wanting to do, it's something that's impinging upon us from the outside world. But the major factor in making the transition from man of earth to the man who has his being in Christ is acknowledging the I. I stand at the door and knock. Now this I of me wants me to acknowledge my Christhood and acknowledge that there is a Son of God in the midst of me. It wants me to settle down and say, be still, Joel, and know that the I within is God. Then I am admitting that I and then everyone who ever comes to me is begging and pleading unknowingly that I recognize their true identity, the I of them. The I of every one of you is knocking at the door of my consciousness, begging me to see you as you really are in your Christhood, in your spiritual identity, in your full purity, in the dignity of your being. You know, a very wonderful thing happened. I call it the most important event in the religious, in the orthodox religious world in 20 centuries. Happened on April 9th. 
the Pope of Rome went to a prison in Rome, something that a Pope hasn't done for several hundred years. And he said to the men, I have not come here out of any romantic reason or humanitarian reason. I have come here because I have beheld Christ incarnate in you. Imagine that. I think that's the greatest event in Orthodox religion in 20 centuries because 20 centuries ago the Master said that to the woman taken in adultery and to the thief on the cross and to all the sinners who came to him, neither do I condemn thee. I behold the Christ in thee. And so it is that you cannot say to those men, I behold Christ incarnate in you without tears coming to their eyes without a mellowing of consciousness, without a softening of their nature. And so it is that a spiritual teacher or practitioner could not possibly give recognition to the Christ incarnate in you without bringing about a change in your nature. If the crust is very tough, it may have to be done for a day, a week, a month, or a year before it yields. So it is. You cannot possibly bear witness to the Christ, to the Christ identity of your parents, your husband, your wife, your children, without it eventually softening, mellowing them. Because you can be assured of this, the eye of them is knocking right now at the door of your consciousness, begging that you recognize it. Every member of your family is begging you to see them as they are, not as they appear to be while they're under the influence of this world. The sad part is we keep right on seeing them as they appear to be and we pin the very errors onto them that we hate. Whereas if only we could see right over the heads of each one of them the word I and recognize that the I of them is knocking at the door of our consciousness for recognition. Now, you know, if we do it openly and outwardly, they're apt to tell us that uh, they're going to call in the man with the white coat. Let's not go down to the supermarket and tell it to them. But let us do it. When you pray, pray where you cannot be seen or heard of men. Enter into the silent sanctuary of your own being and there give recognition to the eye. And everyone you meet, just watch for that eye over their head and you'll see it there. It's there. It's there. Everyone has it. And oh, how it's begging for recognition. The first night that I was invited <coughs> to speak to a group of men in uh, a prison, in Hawaii, one of the officials said, oh, well, I've read the infinite way, and of course you're not going to hold these men for ten minutes. They're going to get restless and troublesome. So you just uh, watch me, and as soon as you see you're losing them, you give me the signal, and uh, I'll call for a cigarette break, and then I'll get up and amuse them with some stories. At the end of an hour, when it was time for the cigarette break, the men said, oh, can't we just smoke and have you go on talking? Mm -hmm. And we went on for two hours, and we went on for two hours and 15 minutes until the warden had to come down and say, it's past bedtime, this has got to break up. 
And then this uh, official came and said, I know how you did it. You hypnotized them. <laughs> but I couldn't say to him, no, the eye of them, the true identity of them was knocking at the door of my consciousness, begging admittance, and I opened my consciousness and took them in recognized their spiritual nature, their spiritual selfhood, and they loved it. They didn't want to leave it because they knew the minute they left it, the gods would be seeing them as bad men, as evil men. And they're not evil men. They're not. They may have done evil things, but who knows what temptations of the world brought that about. But they are not evil men. They are I. Because God made them in his own image and likeness. That's what they are. So when I say to you that we create our own world, this is the way in which we do it. If we want to insist on seeing each other as man of earth, as mortal man, some good, some bad, some well, some sick, then that is the world we are creating for ourselves. But if we have been granted any degree of spiritual discernment so that we can behold the eye of every individual and receive it into our consciousness, acknowledge it, welcome it, bless it, then we transform our world. And from then on, we won't have sick people coming into our consciousness. It'll be like uh, a very, very well-known Christian science practitioner in Los Angeles who is a close friend of mine. And uh, another practitioner came from the East and heard about his great healing qualities and what a great healing practitioner he was. And he went to visit him. And of course, he was in an office answering the telephone, two lines going constantly. And all was he was saying, yes, I will take care of you. Or, yes, just leave it with me. Yes, I'll take care of it right away. Yes, just... And that went on and on and on and on. And this man waited for about an hour and couldn't get in and then finally came to me and he said, this is terrible. All these people calling for help and he promising to give it and he never once gave any one of them a treatment. Ah, I said, you don't understand. This man has a different practice than you're accustomed to. You see, this man doesn't have any sick people come to him. Oh, that's different. <laughs> of course, how could you have a successful healing practice, if you had a spiritual practice, if you had sick people coming to you are we taught how to heal disease? Do we know anything about anatomy or physiology or biology? Do we know anything about germs or broken bones? Of course not. If we had sick people coming to us, we'd never have a healing. The only reason we can have a healing is the only ones who come to us are the sons of God. And the healing consists of recognizing that. Everyone who enters my consciousness has a sign over their head saying I. And that I is knocking at the door of my consciousness, begging me to recognize, to acknowledge, to admit. And when I do, their mortality evaporates. And very soon, they're well or they're better, or they're improved, or they're employed, or something has taken place uh, to bring harmony into their experience. But it only comes through one principle. Not having sick people come to me for healing, or sinning people coming to me for reform, but through spiritual discernment, I see the eye. I recognize it, I accept it, I welcome it, 
bless it, and the first thing you know, they have recognized the I of their own identity. Do you see that there are two worlds? The world over here in which we look out and we see males and females, young and old, sick and well, in which we sit in judgment on appearances. And this world, where we've left that behind, and we recognize omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, but we acknowledge it within me, closer to me than breathing. We acknowledge it within you. We recognize the I of each other, which in every case is the one I, but appearing as individuals. Eventually you will see why life is eternal. Because it makes no difference how many bodies you shed, I go on forever. You shed the body of your infancy, and you went into childhood, and the I was still there. And you became a, a young man, a young woman, and I was still there. And you became middle-aged, and I was still there. And you become old, and I is still there. And then one day you'll shed this body, and you'll find I is still there. Because I is your true identity, and you will take on the form necessary to your experience. At one time you need the body of an infant, and so you'll have an infant's body. And then you'll have the body of a child, and the body of maturity, and the body of middle age, and the body of advanced years. Not necessarily a decrepit body. You'll never have that if you have the I. But someday you'll drop this whole sense of I. The rest of the world will say you died. And you'll be laughing. You'll be saying, how foolish of them to believe that I. And there again, you'll be standing at the door of their consciousness and knocking, saying, here, I'm still here. If they have no spiritual discernment, they'll say, oh no, we buried you. <laughs> Rest in peace. And since you can't get into their consciousness anymore, you'll walk off and tabernacle with those who can accept you as being alive and well. Oh, this kingdom of God that the Master told us to seek. This realm of God, of the real, is a most wonderful place to live in. Scripture, when it says, live and move and have your being in God, this is also not, not just a sentence or a statement. It's an actual state of being. It is possible to live and move and have our being in God, but only when we learn to tabernacle with each other as I. You'd be surprised what happens as we come to know each other in our spiritual identity, the communion that takes place between us, the sanctity of it, the holiness of it, the joy of it. It does, I admit, take a lot of sensuality out of our life that somehow we seem to enjoy But after a while, you'll get to know that it's replaced with other things that are far better than that sensuality, as much pleasurable as it may have once seemed. It's true that money can't do as much for you then, because the things that money can buy are among those sensuous or sensual things that no longer appeal. So you have far less use for money or use for less money, less joy in those things that ordinarily it buys. It's a different kind of a life, living and moving and having and being in God, because we live with each other on a higher level of consciousness, and we even enjoy our homes 
and our automobiles and our vacations in a higher sense than we ever did before. There is less of the sensuousness even about those. We love art and music and beauty more than we ever did, but with less desire to possess them. We're just as satisfied to uh, witness them in a museum or have them on a record. To live, to move, to have your being in God, to be of the household of God, does not separate us from each other. It makes the bond between each other sweeter, dearer, but less demanding upon each other, so that we're more or less sharing. The dominion lies within us. The means of dominion is in recognizing the spiritual nature and identity of every individual. This transforms our world and gives us dominion over it. It gives us dominion over sin and sickness and ultimately over death because in the recognition of our spiritual identity we are now tabernacling with that which was never born and will never die. And so you'll understand why it was that Jesus could say, before Abraham was, I am. I was never born, not even immaculately. I just was never born. And I never will die, even if you crucify me and bury my body. I still will never die. I will be with you unto the end of the world. And that I is crying out for recognition. It'll help when you go to vote tomorrow to remember that every one of those individuals has an eye that's crying out for recognition. Thank you.